Hi, everyone. Welcome to Crowd Forecast News, episode number 183 for June 4th, 2018. Today, we will be discussing the 245th weekly report. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to take a look at this yet, you can uh, go to timingresearch.com and uh, download the full report, or uh, I'm actually posting the full report as a blog post now, so you can read it directly in the uh, browser if you want to. Uh, and uh, let's see. my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of Timing Research, and I have uh, Rob Hanna back to moderate today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Thanks, David. Uh, good to be back, and good to see uh, familiar faces here. Uh, we have uh, uh, Anka Metcalf of Trade Out Loud, John Thomas of the Mad Hedge Fund Trader, and I believe Neil Batho is going to be joining us of, uh, of Trader Review, hopefully in a few minutes, uh, and and then myself. So why don't uh, um, why don't I start off? Let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit about um, your trading and what what you do and and, and your websites. Um, Anka, since uh, you're at the top of the list here, I wrote down, you get to go first. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me on the show today. Um, my name is Anka Medcalf, and I'm the CEO and founder of TradeOutloud.com, which is a trading education firm specialized in educating individuals how to day trade and swing trade uh, the equities and also the futures market. I am a full-time futures day trader as long as a, as well as a swing trader. I have been doing it professionally for over 15 years. Uh, prior to becoming a professional independent trader, I come with 10 plus years in investment banking. And I'm the designer of an institutional proprietary trading system. And the reason why I'm just saying I'm the designer is because I cannot take credit for it. So I just took the system and personalized it to my own needs. Uh, I uh, keep an emphasis on price support resistance, on multiple levels of support resistance, not only supply and demand, not only the basic support resistance, but seven layers. Um, I focus my trading because I'm a very active day trader. I focus my trading on specific uh, trigger times throughout the day, obviously correlated with market timing. I also look to buy or sell or even take profit at, at four specific price zones throughout the charts. Uh, I watch for chart synchronicity and divergency, and uh, especially when day trading and a strict set of trading rules that, that enable myself and my traders to identify trades with ease. I'm also a contributor to a lot of financial media magazines, and uh, also if you would like, I will be participating in Chicago at the Traders Expo. So if you want to stop by and say hi. Uh, I will be there. Um, uh, I would be very happy to meet all of you guys that are will be in the area. All right, great. Thanks, Anka. Uh, good to see you again, and uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, this week. Uh, John, good to see you again too. Hey, how you doing, man? Good. Uh, why don't you tell the people a little about yourself and uh, Mad Hedge Fund Trader to get started? I am a global macro. Uh, uh, long-term and short-term investor uh, looking for the most expensive things in the world to go short, the cheapest things in the world to buy. Uh, and having said that, the cheapest things in the world to buy right now are technology stocks, uh, which are all breaking out to the upside, all hit all-time highs on Friday. We cover stocks, bonds, commodities, precious metals, uh, real estate, and energy. Uh, our most profitable trade of the last nine months has been shorting the treasury market. Uh, we've done uh, 19 round trip trades on the uh, TLT. Every single one of those made money. Uh, and the rest of our portfolio has essentially been long technology for most of that time. Uh, trailing uh, 12 month return for us is 56%. And a lot of our followers uh, make a lot more than that, especially once you do the futures or outright options only. You can find me at www.madhedgefundtrader.com. And uh, I'm now entering my 51st year trading the market. All right. Good. Uh, uh, all good stuff there, John. Uh, and for those that don't know me, I'm Rob Hanna. Um, I've been trading since the late 90s. 
about 20 years, I guess. Um, been a full-time trader since uh, late 2001. And uh, you've, uh, in 2008, I established a site called Quantifiable Edges. In 2012, I created another one called Overnight Edges, which looks to uh, take advantage of overnight um, movement in the futures market. And uh, in 2014, that, uh, that combined with uh, Scott Andrews' Master the Gap site to become Investiquant. Uh, and uh, I now work with uh, Investiquant as well uh, as uh, uh, doing overnight and, uh, and swing research. Um, most of my research is, or all of my research really, is quantitative based. So I'll look at uh, technicals and then I take a look at uh, what they mean. So I'll look at price action or uh, volume or uh, breadth or whatever it is I can think to look at. And uh, I'll run uh, uh, studies uh, to see how the markets performed historically under similar situations. Um, all right, let's uh, let's kind of establish where we fall for this week, and then we'll open the discussion. So, uh, uh, looking for just quick answers here to see who's on what side of things. But um, the first question, as always, is uh, which direction do you think the S&P 500 index is going to move from this coming Monday's open? to Friday's close hasn't moved much since the open this morning. I guess it's up a little bit, uh, but my, uh, uh, my inclination, I'll go first. Mine is up. So I'm bullish this week. Uh, and I'll get into why later. Uh, John, what about you up or down? Uh, I vote for up. I think the investors have got their knickers in a twist. Once again, they are underweight uh, stocks because they have had bad news raining down upon them nonstop since January. So okay. people are positioned for a falling market, and therefore you will get the opposite. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll get into it more in a, in a, in a minute. And uh, Anka, uh, what about you? Are you looking up or down? I'm looking for a continuation higher as well. Oh, okay. All right. Well, hopefully we got different reasons for it <laughs> <laughs> since, uh, since we're all looking up this week. Um, to let you guys know, the uh, uh, the survey looked at uh, 65.8% said higher, 34.2% lower. Um, so about two thirds uh, were looking for uh, an up. Uh, in this case, we got all three of us say, saying up. Uh, the confidence levels uh, were pretty strong. 70% uh, confidence for the uh, those saying higher. And... Uh, 62% for those saying lower. Um, and as David notes in, in the uh, uh, in the report, um, similar conditions have been observed 12 times, in the so not a whole lot of times, uh, with the majority sentiment, sentiment being right 58% of the time. All right, so uh, what is that? Probably seven and five uh, out of those 12 times. So higher seems to be what most people are thinking. Uh, let's, uh, let's get in and talk a little bit about why. Uh, Anka, why don't I let you go first, and then, uh, and then John, and, and then we'll get to me. And Neil, if he ever shows up. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm looking at the SPX. And uh, what I see is that we are trading right now above prior resistance, which is that 2740 zone. And we've pretty much had a really nice consistent lift this morning. Uh, we're trying to digest, obviously, that cluster of resistance that actually formed throughout the month of March. Uh, you know, the volatility that we had since February and still a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, I would say, chop that came from that high volatility spike. Um, and I think that so far we're setting up for a very nice reversal off here, off the 2740. I see a bull flag really strong developing here. Uh, and in fact, I think that right now uh, the S&P is really working on breaking above that zone. If we clear this area, and in fact, I think that if throughout the trading day today or in the upcoming days, as long as we hold these lows and if we don't, literally break below that 2700 
I still think we have a very good chance of continuing higher if we break through that 2750 and continue higher. Uh, and I see another potential target back into the 2774, 2775, and another target into the 2790, which is also some minor resistance there. And obviously the 2800, which where we have another prior pivot high from March 13th. So there's a really considerable void trading above. Um, and I think that if we digest this area and today, it's sort of like one of these grind days where we sort of like really want to, uh, put some, uh, uh, you know, put some highs in there. Uh, what worries me at this point, and I have been using Russell as a little barometer throughout, uh, throughout these uh, few months since the volatility spike is that. Uh, I see Russell weakening a little bit more here. So that is a little bit concerning. I would like Russell and I'm looking at RTY. This is Russell Futures 1650. If we break above that 1650, then we can see some more optimism into the market. One of the biggest performers is NASDAQ, obviously, with uh, a lot of stocks running higher within uh, within this uh, uh, within this uh, index. Uh, and uh, we'll see, but my um, uh, my bias, at least for this week, is higher, even though we are trading into the upper range. But as long as we're holding, and especially I think that today is going to be very important to hold today's low so far that we're established. So I think if S&P is going to manage to hold on to, uh, I would say, the, the 2740 zone from which it bounced today again, I think it's ready to continue higher. It's just a very sloppy consolidation sort of uh, sort of phase, but I think it has thoughts of continuing higher. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and you made some good points with the uh, uh, the Nasdaq also leading the way. I was looking at that as you were mm -hmm. as you were talking, and that's uh, if it's not quite at new all time intraday highs, but if it closed where it is right now. Uh, we'd have an all-time closing high for the NASDAQ. Exactly. Yes. And I'm also looking at Dow. And I think that Dow should be continuing higher a little bit. It's having a hard time digesting uh, the, this range that it is trading in. I mean, we had a really strong push in um, uh, in the first uh, 15 minutes, uh, 15 to 20 minutes in the morning. And then we pretty much ranged in all of these indices. But uh, I see very strong stocks within Dow. We have uh, Boeing, Visa, Home Depot. These are all strong stocks that uh, may try to push Dow higher. But I still don't see this base as being negative. I see it uh, sort of uh, chewing out the resistance at this point. So it's just a, a bullish grind. We'll see by the end of the day how things stand. Okay. Um all right, uh, John. What about you? Are you uh, are you seeing similar stuff, or is there the other observations you want to uh, put in well, there? Well, you know, I'll I'll take all of Anya's technical numbers. I mean, we see this as a run to two eighty in the spy where it fails and goes back to test in the bottom of the range. You know, our whole thesis right. for the John, year. Can you uh, hear me? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted uh, bottom of the range being the range over the last couple of weeks or the range over the last couple of months. Um, really, if, if I, let me get, look at my chart, I see the upside at, uh, 280 yeah. and the downside is going to be rising. Uh, you know, worst case, the 200 day moving average at okay. 262, but I doubt we'll get below 265 on, on the next test. And we only got down to 267 on our last, uh, period of weakness, which was the 50 day moving average. So if the 50 day is holding, that's really quite a strong market. Uh, so uh, our whole thesis for the year is that we're, you know, after a blowout top in January, we trade sideways for 10 months into the midterm elections uh, and then rally into the midterm elections. So, you know, we see market essentially going nowhere for, you know, until uh, August, September, and then starting a year in rally then. So that's the big view. Uh, you know, the fundamentals are the fact that no net money is pouring into the stock market now from any investors except companies buying their own stock back. And that number has doubled 
nearly doubled from 500 billion to 800 billion this year. So companies wow. alone are uh, buying back their own stock, and that's why tech stocks are leading. They are the biggest buyers of their own stock. Uh, if you're not buying back your own stock, your stock is going absolutely nowhere this year. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, our other argument is that uh, all of the stimulus created by the tax bill is being canceled out by trade wars, higher interest rates, higher inflation, uh, and higher oil prices. Uh, so, you know, that's why we're not getting any real improvement in, uh, you know, the overall GDP figures, and that is another drag on the market. So, and why is tech moving? They're immune to all that. Tech Technology is not affected by uh, higher interest rates. In fact, they're a beneficiary of higher interest rates because they all have giant, huge cash mountains. Uh, you know, they're not affected by oil prices. Uh, and, you know, they're not affected by inflation because they are the pre preeminent co creators of deflation. So that's why all the money is pouring into tech. That will continue for years. And historically, tech stocks aren't that expensive. I mean, we're to 20 times multiple now in the dot-com bubble. We peaked at 100. Well, yeah, we're a lot below that. Hopefully, we don't... Um... And everything we've recommended is at an all-time high this morning and has been for several days in a row. That's great. Um, all right. Well, uh, good. I don't think I have any follow-up questions for you right now. Um, the uh, I'm seeing similar stuff as far as the the, the range um, myself a couple I did a couple studies over the weekend um, and looking at what I termed as a breakout in the s p 500 and, and and it's it's a loose definition of a breakout but it's one that I've programmed in the past so we're basically just closing at the first 50 day closing high in uh, in at least 10 days and and the s p did that uh, even though it didn't make a new intraday high on friday but it did make a new closing 50-day high uh and there was a couple of things that made it look uh favorable for the near term looking out over the next five days which is what we're looking at in, the, in this question and uh, one is that spy left an unfilled gap up uh, when spies done that on a breakout uh, a lot of people will term that like a breakaway gap, right? What happens is it leaves people behind that want to get in on that breakout, and and they may not have uh, have been able to. Uh, and often it'll create some some additional momentum going forward over the next several days. The other good news part of it was that it came on lower uh, New York Stock Exchange volume. That may sound counterintuitive to people that look at volume, uh, but studies I've done have shown that. Uh, when you get a, a breakout to a new 50-day high, uh, there, I've looked at three scenarios. One, uh, really high volume. That's a good thing. So if you get a, like a 20-day high in volume on a breakout, you're, you're likely to get follow-through. If you get lower volume, you're also likely to get follow-through. The, the one that doesn't look good is if you get higher volume but only moderately higher. When I say higher, I mean from the day before. So if you get rising volume, that's not a 20-day high in volume. That's generally been a a, uh, a tough thing. Uh, so that's that's something that uh, uh, that I've seen in the past that uh, came up again in my research this weekend. Um, so we got those things going forward on on the breakout. As uh, as you guys mentioned. Uh, Nasdaq's looking great. John John brought it up with a whole bunch of tech stocks, and uh, and that's on the rise. And uh, one indicator I use is a Nasdaq S and P relative strength indicator. It's more of an intermediate term, not just over the next you know five days or whatever. Um, but that's shown that the Nasdaq's been really strong versus the S and P. And of course, you can see that that's near new highs, and the S and P is still quite a ways from from new all time highs. Um, so as long as the NASDAQ continues to lead to the upside, that's generally a good thing. It's a good thing that the Russell's leading to the upside too. Um, shows people have a higher risk appetite, right? When when these other companies are leading rather than the the, the large companies. 
Um, and I think, John, we've discussed that before in the past, too. Yeah, have, have you you've seen similar things, I believe? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, we, you know, you, you look at you, you look at all 101 sectors in the market and you just keep coming back to technology. Uh, you know, the tech stocks account for 25 percent of the S&P 500 market cap. They account for 50 percent of the of the earnings. You know, why even waste time looking at anything else? Any other sector, they have major systemic problems like trade wars, for example. Uh, yeah. Look at U.S. Steel. I mean, it's been, the stock has been slaughtered, uh, even though they've been a, a major beneficiary of protection. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really tough to find things better than technology. So why, why bother? <laughs> Yeah, and I then, guess that's all know, right. That's stocks, uh, you know, it, and there's not even much to look at in other asset classes. You know, I mentioned the bond trade, you know, which is great from the short side. We just had a six and a half point rally, you know, last week, which is a giant gift. Uh, currencies, you know, the strong dollar play has been good all year. Uh, other than that, there's just not much out there. Uh, you know, if you were smart enough to play the oil spike, good for you but you just gave back most of that in the last week. So, uh, uh, you, know, not a, you know, nothing else out there to buy is another powerful argument when it comes to technology stocks. Yeah. Um, Tom McClellan uh, likes to boil it down sometimes uh, as saying that uh, the direction of the market depends on how much money is out there and where it wants to go. And those are the two big, those are the only two factors. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, you know, the, you know, Soros had money with me for a long time and his, the, the big thing he taught me is you want to buy what other people want to buy. And the fundamentals are really almost ir irrelevant. You know, you, you have to go with the flow of funds. Yep. You know, when, when the world was panicking about uh, Facebook, uh, you know, saying it was going to go to zero or go out of business or get regulated out of business. I'm driving around downtown San Francisco watching the completion of a 46-story building, which uh, Facebook just took a 20-year lease out on <laughs> just to handle their Instagram business. You know, a 46-story tower. I'm saying this company doesn't think it's going out of business. I want to buy the stock, and we bought Facebook at, at 150. Yep. You know, that's the stuff that's going on when you get down to the really granular level, get out there, kick the tires, you know, go so see who's going in and other buildings and so on. That's what we do here in addition to the technical stuff. Interesting. Um, Anka, let me go back to you. Do you. Is there anything you're seeing right now that would change your mind, either short term or long term? What are your, what are your concerns um, with regards to market right now? Well, obviously I'm keeping, because I'm a day trader, so I'm keeping a close eye on the markets and uh, at any signs of reversals. But, uh, you know, as John mentioned, you know, that San Francisco example with uh, Facebook, I mean, let's face it, that was a, uh, that was a buy opportunity. And every, and even throughout uh, past earnings season, I mean, throughout this earnings season, I've seen a lot of examples where stocks have gapped down and they were immediately uh, reversed off key support levels. And it just shows that technical levels are in play and strong companies are still going to continue to uh to grind even higher uh i mean let's face it uh everybody has been talking you know about tesla and tesla has been you know one of the uh uh one of the most discussed uh uh stocks and uh so far take a look at the performance i mean it's still uh, and i'm looking uh today at the price action today it's working its way back up to the top of the range i mean I don't think it's going to go down anytime soon. And same with some other stocks. Uh, Apple, uh, for instance, today, new high. Google, impressive move higher. NVIDIA made a new high today. 
I mean, Baba, after the base breakout at two hundred dollars, it's in, it's not it, it's unstoppable. It's trading right now. It made a high today at two hundred eight point nine. Microsoft as well blasted over a hundred dollars, so it pretty much stayed at the ninety eight level for a while, and then when it blasted over one hundred, unstoppable. So right now, made a high today one hundred one. 86 facebook the same john was mentioning facebook facebook now trading at 193 or so uh amazon new high today so i don't have anything that is that is telling me you know this market is bearish we're in for a reversal and the, i think that the fact that we're not going to get a lot of economic releases throughout the week today we may have a grind mode to the upside because let's face it next week we have that a summit that's going to happen in North Korea and I think that traders are going to look probably not to uh you know be very aggressive into that uh uh into that discussion as that discussion is taking place but uh I think that throughout this week you know we may see a grind higher I'm still bullish like I said I'm an intraday trader uh I swing trade stocks so I'm not you know a, a very uh aggressive uh 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 I would say very aggressive investor per se, but uh, I'm a very aggressive day trader. So I watch the intraday charts a lot that give me a, a, a lot of details about the market pulse. And I think that we may be heading a little bit higher. So um, I'm just looking, uh, you know, overall charts and everything that I'm watching here, like Twitter making a new high, Netflix, again, a new high today. I mean, incredible uh and uh you know everything that is going on for this market you know i i still think that we are definitely heading higher and this is you know my bias for higher for okay throughout great this week. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah the uh, only potential negative uh for tech is that it's just so obviously the seminal story of our generation that periodically the buying will bunch up and you'll get short-term tops. Mm -hmm. you know, when somebody like an Anka is sitting on a 30% profit, she's not going to let, you know, that position grow hair on it. She's going to take it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, and so we do get these periodic sell-offs. Remember at one point uh, this year, Amazon was down 25%. And then from that bottom at a thousand, it then rallied 60%. And that is the game you keep playing until the next recession kicks in. And that is going to be a year or two off at the most. So make hay while the sun shines. Uh, you can, you know, sit back and read a novel uh, later in your life, you know, when this whole <laughs> market is over. Um, so uh, counter to the excitement we're, we're showing here, one of the things that I'm greatly concerned about is the uh, – uh, the Fed policy currently where it's reducing the SOMA account, it's basically sucking liquidity um, from the banking system. Yeah, and, it's uh, a quantitative tightening, QT we call it. Yep. So QT is uh, has had a negative impact on prices whenever they've done it. This, this is the first time we've called it QT. But they did something similar back in 2008 where they uh, saw a sharp decline in the SOMA. And uh, I'm sorry, that's short for system open market account. It's the, it's the account at the Fed where they hold all of their bond purchases. In any case, I've, I've done a fair amount of studying on this. And, and even over the last, uh, since QT began in October, there's been a pretty tight correlation between weeks where the there's been big drops in the stock market uh, where we've seen uh, higher t uh, amounts of tightening uh, versus some weeks we've actually still see expansion um, in the SOMA and, and those are the ones that have generally done well. So um, the, the direct correlation may not last forever on a, a you know, there may be more of a time lag or less of a time lag depending on how the market adjusts to this. Um, but overall, the fact that we've got so much QT going on and it's going to increase um, could make for some more volatile environments when you get these uh, liquidity events. So Yeah, the Fed has a total of $4 trillion to take out of the system. Uh, they've barely started that. They really only started this year. 
And ultimately, this is going to create the next interest rate spike, which causes the next recession. Uh, it's not a question of if, but when. Uh, right. you, know, you can almost calculate to the day when the next uh, yield curve inversion happens. And bear markets always follow six months after that. So, uh, you know, we're, we're watching that very closely and, you know, trading with one, one eye on the exit. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, price action will uh, help an awful lot as well, like you guys are saying. So, keep, you know, keep an eye on the longer term indicators and, and, uh, and volatility uh, when that starts spiking up. And we'll, we'll be able to see. Uh, some larger things, but I think we're getting, I'm getting a little bit beyond this week here. Yeah. If I can give you some hard <laughs> numbers, uh, you know, the uh, TLT is trading uh, at around 119 today. Uh, if the 10 year treasury bond goes to 4% next year, which most people expect that takes the TLT from 119 down to 97. Yeah. And that's not, uh, that's not a big stretch. Yeah, and if you can't make money off of that move, maybe you should consider another line of business. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let's get to some of the questions um, on the report as well. Uh, David had a, a several questions on the report this week, so um, let me start with uh, question number four, which is uh, which indicator influences you're trading the most. Uh, Anka, you want to? Uh... Sure. Um, I'm looking at price support resistance mainly. And in terms of indicators, I'm looking at the moving averages. And okay. uh, the moving averages that I'm using are the 20 moving average, simple moving average, the 50 simple moving average, uh, 10 exponential moving average, and also the 200 moving average. And so far, they have been very predictive in. Um, uh, in reversal patterns. So I see that, you know, pretty much there, they have been following trending and, uh, they have been, there have been some very strong reactions off of these, uh, off of these levels. Obviously, uh, I don't exactly go, uh, by these moving averages. So these are just some pure indications. Uh, I have other methods uh, that I establish my buys and my sells, so not necessarily reactions off alone, only uh, uh, off these moving averages. So, uh, but in terms of indicator, obviously in volume, these are the only indicators that are that I use on my charts. Okay, uh, interesting, and uh, and a lot of those charts are are shorter term in. in uh, yes. Yes, uh, uh, even I, use, so I use the same indicators on uh, uh, major time frames and minor time frames. So um, okay. I, I don't use any other indicators. Uh, I think uh, I need to see the way price is reacting. I need to see the way price is uh, uh, behaving uh, before you know I take any kind of decision. So yeah, it gives me, a, let's say, uh, an idea of what to expect and that is because a lot of traders are using these moving averages and obviously you know the crowd it is what gathers you know the crowds and you have to take a quick peek into you know their psychology you know just as candlestick provide and uh in uh, sort of like inside information into you know the psychology of the traders what happens behind that red bar uh, the control of the red bar, the, depending on the shape, uh, the form, the color, et cetera, you know, the same, uh, the same way I'm looking at, uh, moving averages, but this is, this is, uh, this is what I use. I have been using these, uh, for a very long time and, um, uh, have been using them su successfully. Okay, great. John, what about you? What, uh, what, in what indicators influence your, in uh, trading? Well, model? we're about 90% fundamental, 10% technical. When we do look at technicals, we look at the 50 day versus the 200 day moving average. Uh, the problem with technicals is that it's really easy for algorithms to ga game them. Uh, probably 90% of all high frequency trading is around gaming, uh, moving averages. Uh, it's much more difficult for algorithms to game earnings growth or fundamentals or something like that. Uh, also, the the shorter the time frame, the more accurate uh, technicals work. Uh, you you go out longer term, you know, like you know weeks or months. Uh, 
we found that technicals have essentially zero predictive ability. Okay. Um. You know, technicals are driven by belief, and belief can be a powerful thing. Uh, you know, uh, they used to sacrifice humans to get the sun to come back in the spring. Uh, they used to, you know, believe that if you dipped witches uh, in the water, they would float if they were a witch, and if you sank, you were human. Uh, and technicals drive a very large portion of the daily trading volume of the market, so you, you can't dismiss it. Yeah, well, I mean, they, uh, I think technical indicators are mostly just ways to measure the movement and um, uh, the emotion of the people behind it, right? So you're going to get really oversold technical indicators when the market sells off hard. Um, and most of them are going to be saying similar things. You know, do you like... Uh, uh, you know, RSI or Williams percent R or, you know, um, I, um, any yeah, other oscillator really doesn't, doesn't really matter. On yeah. the upside and the downside, suddenly fundamentals become meaningless and it's all about the technicals. The mar you know, during panics, markets become totally technically driven. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it all depends on your time frame. Uh, you know, for someone day trading like like Anka, I don't think uh, fundamentals mean a whole heck of a lot t to you, probably, because um, the fundamentals aren't going to change in the middle of the day, right? They're well, they could <laughs> <laughs> most of the time. They're not going to, unless you get a big news. Uh, yeah, that's out. that's exactly it. Right. You, know, you you can get a big news event uh, which completely reverses uh, fundamentals in the middle of the day. Right. Like an earnings report or something like that, or a, a tweet. A tweet will totally change the fundamentals of a company. Uh, yep. If it's from, you know, Trump or Kardashian. Exactly. Not all <laughs> tweets are created equal. Let's talk about the tweet on Friday. <laughs> the 721 tweet. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, all right. So, uh, I'll answer the question too. Uh, the indicators that I, I use the most, uh, well, at IQ, we, we have uh, nine systems and we run statistics on them. And just taking the averages of the nine systems and looking at the win rate and average profit factor over the next several days helps me establish my market bias. So if, the, uh, uh, if we're looking at a win rate of at least 55% uh, or so, and a profit factor of at least 1.3 uh, on those systems, that's generally a, uh, a real positive over the next few days. And, uh, and if, if it's the opposite, if we're looking at you know, a negative profit factor, a win rate below 50%, um, that suggests that we've got some bearish headwinds coming uh, over the next few days. And that's, that's a simple indicator, but it takes a lot into it. It looks at uh, acceleration, um, it looks at momentum oscillators and it looks at uh, seasonality as well. Uh, I use a similar uh, approach over at Quantifiable Edges uh, with an indicator I call my aggregator. And that looks at basically any studies that uh, I have open. So it could look at anything from VIX action to uh, breadth to uh, uh, simple intraday or multi-day patterns that have that have evolved over the next several days or the last several days. Uh, but the aggregator takes all of the information uh, from about 1200 studies and uh, puts them into a couple simple numbers for me and lets me establish my market bias. Um, and I've done some research I'm going to be releasing in the next few weeks, which actually show that having a market bias is a valuable thing. So I, for instance, I took my aggregator and ran it across systems I have. And the systems are pretty simple setups that would look to, you know, get long any of the S&P 100 stocks based on, you know, if it's oversold in an uptrend, say. And um, doing it when you have the aggregator positive has basically given you all the gains, meaning... If you've got the market behind you, if your market buy, if your way of 
establishing a market bias is correct, then your chances of making money on any individual stock trade are that much better because you know the rising tide lifts all boats and and it and it and it sinks them as well um, if you're going against it. So that's um, uh, that's what I look at for my my in most promising indicators are, are my aggregator and uh, uh, and the IQ system averages. Um, we also have a few other questions. It, the bonus question number one I thought was interesting in that it asked, um, do you regularly listen or watch any financial investing or trading related web shows or podcasts besides timing research? 55% of people said yes and 13, uh, I'm sorry, and 45% and said, said no. Um, I would have thought almost everybody would have looked at something besides just timing research. Um, seems to me it's almost like watching one television show. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I'm I'm going to assume that the three of us look at something um, uh, at some point. Uh, and maybe it's not a show or a podcast. But uh, Anka, are, are there other shows or podcasts that that you look at? Um, that you find interesting or helpful to you? Well, uh, actually, I have to agree with you with the uh, rest of uh, <laughs> rest of the individuals that have answered the question. Not really. I mean, okay. I don't really find any other podcasts interesting, and I have tried to listen in, but they are very vague. Uh, you know, they don't give. You know, they don't provide levels. They don't. You know, they're not accountable. So. Uh, in reality, I, uh, you know, some vague indication, yeah, okay, oil is going to probably go lower if, and it's going to go higher if they're, I don't know, they're counting tankers and they're doing stuff. You know, I, I, I'm a technical trader. And for me, you know, I really need to see where the price is, you know, so I think a bunch of chatter is totally not, um, you know, uh, not really useful. I pay attention to data and this is what interests me. Uh, I'm uh, also, let's say on Twitter, I post some of my ideas there because they are uh, specific ideas. That's what um, I was going to ask, Twitter. So yeah, that, yeah, but, shows, yeah. do you find Twitter helpful? Uh, well, there's, I don't really follow a lot of people on Twitter. Uh, I definitely follow uh, uh, some people. Uh, some individuals, uh, but uh, not, you know, and even the posts, you know, like I said, you know, you have to uh, take a look at, you know, what your decision is. I really do not like to be influenced by any other traders, you know, because this, uh, if I make my mind, let's say on the S&P that is going to continue higher or on something that is going to continue lower, or if I have a uh, conviction about something I don't want to be influenced and I don't want to agree with someone or disagree I have my own uh, my own opinion on the stock I have my own opinion on the index uh, and I really you know I, I'm truly not looking for confirmation and I'm not looking to see what the other traders are seeing or doing I think that we have all the information on the charts here I don't know I'm just curious to see what you guys think about it <laughs> okay um John, you want to go first? You want me to go first? I'll give you the choice. Well, having uh, worked in financial media and as running hedge funds, I have a pretty firm view on this. Uh, if you see somebody on TV, they're there because they don't know how to make money. You know, if if they did know how to make money, they'd be running, you know, a billion dollar book somewhere, pulling down $10 million a year for themselves, you know. Uh, at Morgan Stanley, we always used to take the biggest dummy on the trading desk and make him the guy responsible for talking to CNBC because the real money makers, we want to keep them on the desk making money. Uh, you know, the, the only uh, exception to that is when you hear a, a banker being interviewed from JP Morgan or PIMCO or somebody like that, uh, you know, giving the firms extremely well researched uh, in-house opinion. But you know, commentators are commentating for a living and that's because they don't know how to do anything else. So they're great at getting you in at market tops and getting you out at market bottoms. You know, they do it like clock, clockwork. So 
you know, w- watching the media uh, can be dangerous to your financial health. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm alone on this one then. Um, there is one. Uh, I'll suggest a podcast to people uh, other than this one. Um, I do like this one. Um, but Andrew Swanscott has one called Better System Trader, which he uh, interviews people. And I, he seems to uh, do a good job of interviewing and, and uh, some, some good ideas um, people do offer on that one. So that's, um, that's something I enjoy listening to in the car from time to time. Um, and no, oh, well, Oh, um, Rob, I'll just, uh, go ahead and mention too, that, uh, the reason I put these, uh, this question and, and the other two on, on here is because I'm looking into, um, publishing the timing research shows on, on some of the other like podcast, uh, uh, you know, like Stitcher and iTunes and, and, okay. uh, Places like Podbean, that sort of thing, so people can listen to the show if they want without, uh, you know, download it as a podcast through one of the networks and and listen to it without uh, having to go to the website or YouTube if they want. So I'm looking into doing that. So if anyone watching is interested in in uh, subscribing, once I have that set up, just uh, send me a message uh, either through the contact page on the site or reply to any timing research email, and I'll I'll let you know when I have that set up. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, FYI, I, I listen to uh, podcasts on iTunes. But that's uh, okay. Uh, that's, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a big uh, yeah. iTunes is a big one for podcasts and Stitcher. And I just found uh, the one you were talking about, the Better System Trader. Yeah, found, found that on uh, Podbean. That's what I use personally to okay. find podcasts. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to work on getting the timing research show on, on some of these other ones as well, besides just my site and YouTube. Yeah, that'll be great. I think, uh, I think it would make a great uh, podcast. And the nice, thing about, the nice thing about having that format is that it gets pushed to people every week um, yeah. when, they, when they subscribe to it. So um, even if they don't notice the emails or whatever, they'll, they'll get the, the podcast update. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's great. And, uh, uh, good luck with all, with all that. I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll, uh, I'm sure it'll help your, uh, um, uh, listenership. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to do the, uh, everyone's yeah. trade idea of the week now? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to do. Uh, unless, uh, Anka or John, you wanted to jump in with uh, other thoughts with regards to to these questions regarding um, uh, podcasts. If you had, if there, if if you thought of one that you that you do listen to at all. Okay, so let's move on to the the trade ideas. Um, Anka, if you um, you want to start. Sure. Um, um, well, here's the thing. Um, I'm watching uh, the financial sector, XLF, uh, along with uh, some other financial stocks right now, like JP Morgan. So I have a whole bunch of financials on my watch list. Um, and uh, JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo as well. Um, you know, um, l- like I said, uh, Bank of America, but I th- still think that they're not ready to go yet. Uh, I always get in with confirmation. I don't get ahead of the time, but I can give you some numbers. Um, and uh, for traders that are interested in, um, let's say, uh, trading the financial sector, I think, and I um, um, and I was talking about this this morning in my trading room, uh, twenty seven dollars and about seventy cents. Twenty seven seventy is the area that I will start watching XLF. I'm gonna watch for a for for a first move a little higher, and then I'm gonna get in with confirmation. So I'm not gonna get at the first trigger in. I just need to see the price react a little more, uh, because it may not be ready. So we may get that trigger, and the price may fizzle out, and then um, we don't want that to happen. But uh, Bank of America, same concept. I'm looking uh, to get it over $29.80. 
I'm looking at JP Morgan as well. Uh, JP Morgan, uh, well, JP Morgan, here's the thing. It needs uh, it needs a little bit more clarity. So I'm I'm gonna I have an alert at 110. I love to see it over 110 and then pull back possibly to 109.5 and then you know take off from that point. Uh, and other than that, Goldman in terms of, in terms of Goldman Sachs, I have no interest right now. So these are pretty much uh, three of the symbols that um, I have on my watch list and. Uh, um, as far as uh, swing trading, uh, swing, swing trading uh, today, I haven't taken any positions yet. So it is a little bit, uh, you know, um, bizarre because I always push a little bit more harder on Monday. But um, no, I'm still in some trades from last week, and I'm still uh, trailing those trades, and I don't see anything. Uh, um you know just 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 as of now very interesting if uh, um you know speaking of tech stocks i think that mu is very interesting the way it pulled back to minor support level uh into the 56 uh, 5680 zone and it is reversing now. I think that a reversal over 5940 can bring more upside back into the high of the day. So it really needs to trade over 60 and then it's well well on its way into the 63, 64 zone. These are just some few trade ideas. Other than that, you know, I'm basically uh, I'm basically a day trader and I day trade the futures indices. So that's pretty much it that I'm watching. Okay, thanks, Anka. Um... I'll come back to you in a minute to, to see if you, there's anything you want to talk about uh, as far as your site as well. Let's get the trade ideas out there first. Uh, John, uh, you want to uh, let us know anything you're looking at this week that uh, you think might be a decent trade? Well, our trades for the week, we put on Friday and this morning at the opening. We bought Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and Salesforce. Uh, all of those are all, at all time highs as we speak, uh, you know, all on a momentum breakout play from their recent ranges. Um, and we think they go much higher into year end. Uh, and just as a flyer, we bought the uh, IBB, the biotechnology index, uh, because it's trading now against a really solid bottom at, you know, 100, which goes all the way back a year. Uh, we think that sector has been beat up enough, so we did a call spread uh, on the IBB, and it also is looking like it's breaking out. Uh, and those are our, our trades for the week. Uh, we covered all our shorts in the bond market uh, last week, uh, you know, at the lows, and we're, you know, basically looking to reestablish new short positions on a bigger rally in the bond market. Okay, great. Um, the trade I got two trade ideas. Uh, well, really, okay. So one is uh, Halberton, looking for a bounce there, uh, and that's uh, that's pulling back hard over the last uh, couple of weeks, and it's now approaching its 200-day moving average, is approaching uh, support from February March time frame and uh, looks to be ready to bounce a, a bit here. The, um, the issue is that the market as a whole is, is uh, overbought. So I'm not uh, overly excited about jumping into pretty much anything until we get a little bit of a pullback. Um, and if we do get a little bit of a pullback, um, I'm sure John will agree with me here, uh, QQQ. Um, if we can, if it can pull back, uh, maybe Tuesday and Wednesday, I'd be looking to buy it on Thursday or Friday. Uh, yeah. My question on Halliburton yeah. is if OPEC ends the quota system for production, what will that do to Halliburton? Well, who knows, but everybody seems to be worried about it. So that's the, uh, uh, that's part of why it's pulling back here. So if the news yeah. is bad, maybe much of it's out. If the news is good, it could get a real pop. Yeah, um, I think the short answer there is that all the entire energy sector gives up all of its 2018 gains. Uh, which aren't a whole heck of a lot, right? I mean, at well, least Albertans is even on the year. 
Yeah, we've already pulled back from just short of 80, you know, all the way back to the high 60s. Uh, so we've already taken a hit. But, you know, if they really do end the quota system, allow unlimited production from OPEC, then uh, oil could go down to, to 50. Which my car would like. The whole energy sector gets wiped out. Um, yeah, it's not something I'm looking for for a long-term play here. So I'm looking for a bounce. You get a close over like the 10 day moving average and, and I'm out. But I, it, at this point, as sold off as it is, that's where I'm looking uh, for a possible bounce opportunity, make a few percent. Um, and that's how I swing trade. And I, and I see oil here with a double signal as well. Uh, because the weekly is still uptrending, you know, you know, speaking technically, uh, still up trending on the weekly it is uh trading into a lot of support here uh it is trying to grind a little lower but it's really hard to short here and also um uh the monthly charts suggest more selling so i have a weekly that is trying to hold support and then a monthly that wants to give up that support level and tries to break lower so um yeah it's really hard to say which way uh is it gonna go but i have to agree with john um, you know, we, we probably may see, uh, we may see, uh, oil back. And I said not the fifties, but I said probably into the sixties. Okay. Uh, anything you want to let us know about, uh, things going on at Matt head Trader? trader, uh, any, uh, any special offers or anything like that, uh, at this point, uh, that you want to tell us about John, you know, just, uh, we, uh, offer a long short global macro service uh trailing return of 56 percent uh we've been doing this now for 11 years it's one of the longest track records in the industry uh and if you want to boost those kind of high numbers for yourself uh go to madhedgefundtrader.com and uh sign up for our free research and uh, uh that'll get you into our free research and webinar cycle uh, and we send out, you know, free research pieces every day to our, our followers. If you want to get into our uh, options trading service, our trade alert service, uh, you know, we offer uh, one-year subscriptions for that. Okay, great. Uh, Anka, what about you? Anything going on at uh, uh, Trade Out Loud that you want to uh, tell us about? I couldn't read my own writing there. I'm like, oh, you're right. Okay, so uh, we, uh, if you guys want to trade live with me every single day, I run a trading room from nine o'clock in the morning till four o'clock. Uh, we day trade and also some unique opportunities for swing trading. Uh, if you want to sign up, uh, you could visit our website. It is on tradeoutloud.com. Just click on the uh, trading room tab and it's going to take you right there. So uh, we're having, you know, we're, every single day, I usually take from one to three, uh, one to three trades. Uh, uh, these are day trades and uh, also swing trades may also be called, not as often, but uh, swing trades may be called. I'm uh, mostly uh, focused on just a few commodities, not, you know, not futures all across the board. So just very, very few commodities. Uh, we have a transparent pra track record at uh, tradeoutloud.com forward slash portfolio. Uh, our portfolio uh, is uh, is looking really, really nice. So uh, we are way, way up there on the year and have had a really tremendous uh, first quarter and amazing second quarter. We actually made more money in February than, you know, than we would have expected in March as well. And we just ended uh, a phenomenal May uh, looking forward to some unique opportunities in June. And just because, you know, we're just heading into the end of the quarter and into summer doesn't mean that trading is going to slow down. And I think that adage that sell and may go away is not valid with uh, all the algos that are out here. You know, I think the volume is still going to be in, maybe not as much throughout the summer, but we're going to probably have a very nice, uh, interesting summer. So, uh, definitely worth a try. If you don't have to trade alone, if you want to try us out, just go to our website. It is a day trading room specialized in futures trading. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Anka. Um, and you can all find me at uh, investquant.com and quantifiableedges.com. Quantifiable edges, you can take a free trial anytime. Uh, at uh, at Investaquant, I uh, I do two services there. One is called the Navigator. It's a uh, uh, it's a letter that looks at our systems on a nightly basis, and uh, I offer trade ideas through that. Um, and then the other one is uh, our Overnight Edges service. I'm going to be giving a swing trading seminar on um, Thursday this week, I believe. So uh, come to Investaquant. Uh, you can sign up for uh, a free trial there, and I'm sure you'll get information about the, uh, uh, the seminar coming up this week as well. Uh, you can reach me at rob at, uh, uh, at investquant.com as well. Thanks, David, for, for having me again. It was great getting to talk to, uh, to Anka and John. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Great show. Uh, for, those, uh, for those of you watching, be sure to hit the YouTube subscribe button. Uh, if you haven't, haven't yet, to get updates on future shows, you can also go to timingresearch.com to get access to the uh, uh, full version of the report or any of the show archives. Um, be sure to join us uh, tomorrow, uh, June 5th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time for the 37th episode of Analyze Your Trade. Uh, Larry Gaines, Jim Kenny, and Dean Jenkins will be on for that one. And just want to thank my guests again for this week. Uh, Neil Batho was supposed to be here, but he had some uh, technical issues. So hopefully we'll have him back soon. And uh, Anka Metcalf of tradeoutloud.com, John Thomas of madhedgefundtrader.com, and Rob Hanna of investaquant.com and quantifiableedges.com. So thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.